Welcome to the History Nerds United podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Our final present of the holiday season, my interview with William Carlson about his book, Jungle of Stone. Uh, if you didn't listen from the other two intros, these are just episodes we had in our archives. We wanted everybody to be able to hear them, right? Still kind of in the beginning. We we're figuring everything out and stuff, but they were such good interviews. These authors were so great. I wanted to make sure that everyone got to hear them. So... I guess I'll just shut up and let's talk to William about his freaking amazing book, Jungle of Stone. Let's do it. William Carlson, author of Jungle of Stone, thanks so much for joining the History Nerds United podcast today. Thanks for having me. And I know you go by Bill. Bill, one big thing that I think we need to talk about right off the bat is uh, you're a pretty big deal. A uh, journalist for a long time, also was a finalist for the Pulitzer, which right off the bat... Do you remember the day you found out that you were a finalist? I mean, did you immediately start going to party or what? Oh, well, we were we were pretty happy uh, on the Chronicle, um, uh, San Francisco Chronicle. We were very happy. We didn't we didn't make it though. We were the the, the Pulitzer they give the Pulitzer the finalists, there's 3 and they they pick one of 3. And so we got beat out by the Portland Oregonian. Um, so we were kind of disappointed on the day that the Pulitzers were given out, but it's not easy to make the finals. So we were very pleased to, to make the finals. So now you're a journalist by trade and then you write jungle of stone. You know, how do you go, how do you go from, you know, journalism and, and doing that type of writing? What made you all of a sudden say, Hey, this is a book I need to write. Well, Journalism is an interesting career. What, what, most of my career, I used to have to fight to get uh, any kind of uh, length story into the newspaper. You know, it's very competitive between reporters to get their story you know, on the front page if you can do it or inside. But there's not much room, so you write short pieces. They're not long. But the last part of my career at the Chronicle was uh, investigative reporting. And so I spent a lot of time doing deep research uh, up to six months at a time for a series of stories. So that was the kind of the beginning. That was the end of my day-to-day -day journalistic uh, reporting career. So when I, uh, I left the Chronicle, um, I was kind of teed up to doing a book. You know, I mean, the book is the next thing. You know, you go from, I mean, I skipped magazines, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, um, but how it really came about is uh, my wife and I uh, had a house in Guatemala in um, a town called La Antigua, which is a, a wonderful place up in the, up in the uh, mountains of Guatemala called the Land of Eternal Spring. It's in the 70s year-round. Uh, it's, it was the Spanish capital of all of Central America and Southern Mexico. And cobblestone streets, beautiful place. So we had a house there, and I had read... A, a book by this guy named John L. Stevens, John, John Lloyd Stevens, about his adventures in the mid-1800s coming down to Guatemala as an um, uh, ambassador, as an envoy from the government. Martin Van Buren sent him. Um, and so I read his books about his, um, his adventures, and it just knocked me out. These books are fabulous books. Uh, there, he's, he wrote two uh, two books with uh, two volumes each uh, about his his journey through Central America and Mexico. And so I just couldn't believe these books. So um, one day we were back in San Francisco because we went back and forth to our house in Guatemala. And I started looking into it and I found out that his personal papers were at the University of California at Berkeley across the bay from San Francisco. And I was teaching there at the time, uh, teaching journalism. So, uh, and I also graduated from the journalism school and undergraduate from, from UC Berkeley. So I went over to the library, the Bancroft Library, which is a historic, it's, a, it's an archive for historic papers on, uh, on um, basically the West, but California and so on. And we started reading his papers. And, you know, um, I couldn't believe it. I had access to his papers. And only one book had ever been written about him, one biography. And it wasn't very good, and it was written back in the 1930s. So it was a kind of wide-open field for me. Plus, while I was in Guatemala, very often, I would go to the ruins of the Maya in the civilization. Um, I went to Honduras, to a place called Copan. Um, I went to um, Tikal, which is in Guatemala. 
I went to uh, several, quite a few ruins in Mexico. Um, but I, I just did it as a tourist. You know, I never, I wasn't thinking about it in any other way. I was just fascinated by the Mayan civilization. So now here, everything, it was like the perfect storm. Everything came together. Here was, you know, I was fascinated by his book. I had his personal papers. I live in Guatemala off and on. And so I decided to follow his, follow his course, follow his journey from the day he arrived till he, he left. And he went down there with another guy named Frederick Catherwood, who uh, contracted with him to do the illustrations for the books. So that's how, that's how Jungle Stone came about. I mean, that's pretty amazing. It was like your life was kind of slapping you in the face saying, you need to write this book. I mean, everything, like you said, it was a perfect storm. Everything lined up. And, I mean, you know, with Catherwood and Stevens, it, it was kind of the same thing that it came about for them as well, right? I mean, th they come together. It's it, it just sounds like, for lack of a better term, I think the kids would say, a bromance at first sight for these two guys. You know, it's not like they grew up together and knew each other for decades. They just kind of, you know, met out in the world and then all of a sudden decided to go into the jungle together, right? Well, it was fascinating because the more I dug into both of their lives, and I spent a long time on this book, uh, because it's, it's really partly a, a biography of the two men. Uh, and, it, I mean, that's, that's a good part of it. Uh, it's the extraordinary journey of Stevens and Catherwood, meaning not only their journey to Central America, but also the journey of their lives. So I did biographies within the books of both men, and they they didn't meet until um, the mid uh, 1830s uh, in New York. But prior to that, they had covered the same ground. They were both adventurous men, um, and uh, Stevens had gone to Europe, um, and he had gone to Greece, he had gone to Turkey. He'd go on to uh, Russia. Now imagine, this is in the 1830s. Uh, traveled through Russia, Poland, back to France, back to Italy, and then he went to Egypt. And so he traveled up the Nile in Egypt. And then he went across the Sinai Desert to a place in Jordan called Petra, which no, very few people had ever gone to because the... Um, it was, it was uh, the Bedouins protected it, but it was an ancient site of the Romans in a valley. Anyway, so he traveled like this, went to Jerusalem, and eventually came back and wrote several books about those journeys. Meanwhile, Catherwood, maybe five years earlier, had done very much the same thing. He was an architect in England, and he went to Rome to study architecture. And then met some people in Rome, and they went to Egypt, and they went up the Nile to study all of the Egyptian ruins. And then he went to Jerusalem to study the, the Muslim architecture of the, uh, the, the Temple of the Dome, which is still there in, in, in Jerusalem. And went the first person ever to do any kind of illustrations of that. Then he came back to uh, England and, and ended up in New York as an architect and, and built a it, what was called a roundabout, so that he could do these giant 360-degree canvases from his sketches that showed you stood in the middle and you turned around and you could see all of Jerusalem uh, or all of uh, some of the Egyptian ruins and so on. So he had a business there. So they met in New York. And when they met, they couldn't believe it. They'd covered the same ground. They had the same interests. And it, the, the beauty of it was... Catherwood was an artist, and Stevens was a phenomenal writer. So it was it was like magic, and so it was it was meant to be. And so they they said well, they'd heard rumors about some stone ruins in Central America. Very little was known about them, and and so Stevens said, "Well, you know, I'm going to." He had political connections with Martin Van Buren who was a governor of New York, and he was from New York City. Uh, he'd grown up in New York City, Stevens. And so he asked to get this job as an envoy to Central America. So off they went. They, they signed a contract between the two of them, and, and off they went. And, and it was, I mean, they didn't, this was actually prior to photography. Photography didn't exist. It was just about 
to exist. And uh, so having an illustrator like Catherine Wood was really essential to uh, Stephen's uh, books, you know, to be able to see the ruins as well as, uh, you know, the description of their travels. Honestly, I think it's the most striking part of the entire story is I remember reading your book and, you know, I get a little bit into it and then I'll go to the pictures. And I remember looking at the pictures thinking like, oh, this must be a reproduction of what Cather Wood did or anything like that. And then looking and saying, no, like, this is what he did in the middle of a jungle. And I mean, these are, they're detailed, they're striking, and he did so many of them. And you, you just think about getting everything he needs to go out there and do that in, in some place that is not heavily populated. You know, you got just all sorts of things that can go wrong. And yet the things that he came out with are just amazing to look at in and of themselves. Well, they're brilliant. And, and these guys were incredibly determined. They persevered through, I mean, you know, the heat of the jungle, the mosquitoes, they had bout after bout of malaria. They had to dodge poisonous snakes. Uh, it, w it was incredible what they went through to, to do this. But when they got to the first ruins in Copan in Honduras, it was in the thick of the jungle, and they had no idea what they were about to find. They were blown away when they saw these 10, 12-foot uh, monoliths carved in incredible, incredible. They were the kings of the Amaya uh, city-states. And uh, so Catherwood had to try to figure out a way to to put this down on paper. Now, he brought all his sketching stuff. He brought all his, his, his utensils or whatever. But the mosquitoes were so bad, he had to have gloves on. His, his, he was standing in, in mud because it was the rainy season or the end of the rainy season. It's the middle of the jungle. They had to hire people to cut away enough of the jungle so that the light could come in. It, not to speak, not to mention, cut away all of the vines and everything else that were covering the monuments. So uh, he had to create, and, and no one had ever seen anything like these ruins. They were out of this world. There's nothing like them. They're 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 totally unique, and and deep etching carving into these uh, sandstone uh, monoliths that they quarried. And uh, so he, he couldn't even conceive of this. He had been in Egypt. He'd seen those ruins. He'd been to Rome and Greece. He'd seen the ruins there. But nothing. This was like nothing had ever been seen. Like, so he had to, in his own mind, he, he, had a, he went through sketch after sketch and threw them away, you know, because he couldn't, he, could, he couldn't quite understand. He had to change his whole mental and visual uh, abilities to cope with this this new not only the conditions but the thing that he was looking at and so as they went on they went to 44 cities they did they they discovered 44 cities now some of these were out in the open and had been seen by other people but but primarily they they discovered you know dozens and dozens of cities that no one except the natives of course knew about the natives by the way that they encountered had no idea what these ruins were they had no history, oral history, anything else, because it goes back 2,000 years. So they had no understanding. They were just stones, just stones in the jungle, carved stones. Um, you know, so uh, Catherwood and Stevens, you know, were the first ones to kind of realize this could be a civilization, an entire civilization. And they pieced it together as they went. And that's a good point, too, and something, you know, I, I wanted to be clear about when, you know, I, I wrote up my review of the book is that it, you wouldn't say that they discovered the Maya, per se, right? Because, as you said, there were things that were just sitting out there. It was just they gave kind of the world a better understanding and a better view of, you know, what, what we call the Maya, which was, you know, back then still they didn't call themselves the Maya or anything like that, but that they went back and really um, rediscovered the Maya and highlighted it and kind of put it out there for the world to see. Would you kind of agree with it from that perspective? Um, much of this was covered by jungle. I mean, really, really, just thick jungle. And uh, and to this day, they're still excavating uh, uh, temples and palaces. It's still going on in Guatemala and, and in, in, in Mexico and Honduras. Uh, so this civilization was so immense, and um, so they they were really the first ones to bring it to the attention of the world. 
Uh, the Spanish knew a little bit about it because you know they were they were in charge. They they had they 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 were they colonial government down there, so they had a little inkling about it. But what they the little that they knew, they kept secret. They didn't want the world to know about it. So so Stevens and Catherwood brought it to world attention, and essentially they they in doing so they created archaeology. I mean, they were the first ones. There were certainly diggings that were going on in Pompeii, in, in southern Italy, and, and obviously in Egypt, although in Egypt, all the ruins were in the desert, and most of them are, were visible for thousands of years. So, you know, they, were, they weren't hidden. But they were the, the idea of archaeology, of digging out, you know, and, and, and recording everything in a very detailed and careful way, started with Stevens and Catherwood and in in their you know they would hire people to to tear the jungle away so they could see these ruins and so um, yes you could call it rediscovery or discovery I mean the Maya certainly knew what it was about 2,000 year, years ago when they were building it but it had fallen in around 900 AD and for the next 800 years, 900 years, no one paid any attention to it. The Spanish didn't when they came, and it was all covered naturally by the jungle. And so it really disappeared. For all intents and purposes, it disappeared until Stevens and Catherwood showed up on, on the scene and, you know, dug it out and, and, and brought it to the world's attention. And they, from that point on, people read his books. People would go to Guatemala with his books, his and Catherwood's books, and they would follow his trail. You know, this, the, the French would do it, the Germans did it, Austrians did it, of course, Americans did it, Mexicans did it. You know, Guatemalan and Mayan research is, is a huge, a huge um, academic um, um, subject. And, of course, they, had to, they also had to translate the, um, the hieroglyphs to get to the history. So... This, you know, all this has been going on. It started with them, and um, and they deserve the credit for sure because it started with them. But that's the way I did. So I took his books, and I started where they landed, and in in on a, an inner lake in Guatemala, and I had an old beat up um, 1985 Toyota Corolla. No, no hub, no hubcat hubcaps, excuse me, you know, the, the, the paint had burned off of it. There was no, uh, no radio, um, you know, no air conditioning. <laughs> it was the closest thing that I could uh, simulate to what they had when they did their journeys, and their, which was on mules. So my wife and I ended up calling our car uh, the mule. Uh, and so I took that, that, that car, that old Toyota, to the point at which they landed, and I followed their entire uh, course uh, through, with this, with their books in hand. You know, I followed their entire course through Guatemala to Honduras, through all through Guatemala into Mexico, up into the Yucatan of Mexico, and 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 did the whole course. And so, and a lot of people today write me and tell me that they're doing the same thing on my book and and Stephen's books. So you know, it, it's fun because. Um, it's it's a great it's a great adventure number one and it's it's stunning to realize that there was a civilization like the Maya um, two thousand twenty five hundred years ago. Now, did you take your wife with you? Because I feel like that's a huge risk. I mean, you're really putting some pressure on a marriage there. Um, no, for part of it she came. Yeah, for part of it she was she was with me. You know, we we traveled extensively in Guatemala to other places as well. Um, it, you know, there's a risk. Of course, there's a risk, but um, they had worse risk, by the way. Um, this is something that you know of having read the book. <clears throat> they landed in Guatemala and Central America when all of the Central American states that are now, you know, Salvador, Honduras, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala, were fighting. With it. There was a huge civil war going on. It was a brutal civil war because... They had, prior to uh, Stevens and Catherwood arriving, at one point they had united all of those now separate countries uh, 
into a United States of Central America, more or less. And these, uh, these states, uh, these are now nations, were fighting to break away from a united Central America. And so they, they, they were led by an Indian leader. And so the, the Indians rose up. So the, they, they were like vicious. It was a vicious fight between the separatists that wanted to separate all the, the nations and the people that wanted to keep it all together who were far more advanced and enlightened and educated and you know they thought that would be the best way to go and so the separatists used the indians they found a guy named carrera who was a mag magnetic charismatic indian leader and they used essentially used the indians to rise up and so it, it, that's just the background so <laughs> into this comes Stevens and Catherwood. And Stevens, not only did he want to go do the runes, you know, that was what they really wanted to do, he and Catherwood, because their background with all the travel that they had done in the Middle East, and they, he was appointed the envoy to the Central American government in Guatemala City um, to do a new trade agreement. So he walks, they walk right into this this huge, and at one point they're taken hostage. They're kept in a, in, in a room under under uh, under guard um, with these guys with these old muskets. You know, I mean, it, it's his adventure, the adventure of of, of his book. And you know, I try to recreate as much of that as I can in in my book. Is it's, it's just it's it's a rollicking, crazy thing that they did. I mean, I don't know if anyone would would do what they today what they did when they did it, really. I mean, it's amazing, first of all, they lived. And, you know, another thing, too, when you're talking about explorers under these conditions, um, you know, Stephen and uh, Catherwood, they were a, a lot fairer, um, a lot more humane in the way they went about everything. They seemed to take great care going along. Now, I'm not saying they necessarily paid market price for a lot of things, but as they kind of work through this, you don't see some of that ruthlessness that a lot of other explorers under these conditions would resort to at the drop of a hat. Right. No, they were very humane people. Very, very so. That's true. And especially under the circumstances of what you're talking about where, you know, they never really knew. Every time they switched to town, you know, you don't know if you've made enemies by being at a different town and things like that. And it's I mean, I, it's not even taking the weather into account. This sounds just like an, a nightmare that would kill 9 out of 10, and somehow they both were able to do it and come out with what they came out with. Exactly, yeah. And then one thing I, I always find interesting, you know, especially um, going back and doing more research, is that Catherwood really made these amazing illustrations, and we really don't know what he looks like. Um, I remember looking and there is that one picture that it looks like he might have done a self-portrait and then they've also said that that's actually probably somebody else that was with them but it's amazing that he was so prolific with what he did and yet we look back now we actually don't even know what he really looks like it's a great irony um because he's one of the great illustrators of his time and especially with his books uh, he did very large um folio um i, I saw his original i had it to get out. I mean, I went all over, all over the um, United States doing the research, uh, both at the New York Historical Society and the Bancroft Library here, but also in, in Pennsylvania. I finally got to see his original uh, drawings for his large folio um, of of the ruins that, and all of those are in the book, my book as well, and uh, and I had them replicated in a way that. We got the detail to the to the max in the book, so that it's as clear as right off his page. You know, if you're short of looking at the actual size, I mean, they're oversized folios. Um, so, but all of that, and and the the one that they think is Catherwood, is uh, in uh, the one of the final runes that they came to, <clears throat> a place that a lot of people that go down to Mexico to Cancun and, and, and have ever been down there, Quintana Roo in the Yucatan, is a place called Tulum. It's a very popular place um, for people to go um, from Cancun 
to see the Maya ruins. And so there is a there is a uh, illustration he did of presumably I, I, I think I think it's pretty clear that it is him, but it's very small. He's he's very small in scale to the ruins behind him, and he's holding a tape. And that's how they measured. They, they measured everything. They measured all these rooms. And so he's holding the one end of the tape, and Stevens is holding the other. And so it's assumed that, that he put himself in to that one drawing, and only that one drawing. So it is, it is kind of ironic that, that he, he doesn't show up in, in more of his own work or in someone else's work, you know. And, and I can't prove this, obviously, at all, but I think maybe Stevens probably told him at the very end, like, can you please just put yourself in there for once? People are going to ask questions hundreds of years from now. Yeah, maybe he did. Maybe Stevens did. They were great friends. They were great friends. As my book goes on, you know, after they discover the Maya, you know, there's one thing about my book is that it's not really exactly about the Maya. There are many, many great books about the Maya and the Maya civilization. My book was about Stevens and Catherwood. And, uh, and as I say, a lot of the biographies in there, certainly the central part of the book is about them discovering, you know, going down to Central America and uncovering all of these ruins. That's, that's really the, the major part of the book. And there is a part of the book in which I try to, de- just one, one chapter, but I try to describe the Maya, but it doesn't do justice to the Maya. So some people have been disappointed. They get the book and they think, well, God, you know, it's a great book, it's a great adventure, but, you know, I was, I, I thought I was going to read all about the Maya. Uh, it's in there, but, and I, at the end of the book, I tell you, you know, I have a list of books that, that I think are the best books if you really want to study the Mayan civilization. But also, after they finished all of their adventures down there, uh, they went on to different careers. He, um, um, Catherwood went on to be a railroad man um, in England and then in South America um, because he had a family to support. Stevens never married, but uh, he went back to New York City, um, never took up the law. He was a lawyer, and uh, um, prior to going down to Central America and his travels in Europe, he was a lawyer, but he never practiced much. And when he got back, he didn't practice much either. He made a fortune on the books. His books were the best sellers of the time. The books, they couldn't print books fast enough in the 1840s. It was the Harper Brothers, which by the way, the Harper Collins is, is the uh, publisher that published my book. So they, they just couldn't print them fast enough. And they had them in, in different languages. In England, they came out in England, they came out in Europe. Um, and so, he made a fortune with these books, and Catherwood made some of that, but he really, uh, the copyrights went to Stevens, and, and Stevens helped him out and, you know, paid him, you know, for his work and, and all of that. But he did pretty well, and so I, he kind of, like, disappeared for a while, for a couple of years after he came back. But, you know, the interesting thing was Catherwood kept wanting to go to the next adventure, and so he proposed at one point with Stevens a couple of years after they got back, let's go down to Peru because the Incas are down there. And that's another, uh, you know, ancient civilization that the Spanish discovered when they took over Peru. And so let's go down there and see what's down there, you know. And Stevens said, oh, he said, I think I've had enough bouts of malaria. I don't know. I'm not going to do it, you know. And had they gone... They almost certainly would have discovered Machu Picchu 60 years before a guy named Stephen Bingham discovered it. But that's how close they came to actually going on a, another adventure and, and actually discovering Machu Picchu. But So uh, Stevens got involved in, in railroads a little bit, and then he got involved in building the first railroad across Panama. This was the time of the gold rush in 1848 in California. And so everyone either had to go all the way down around the, the, uh, you know, the Cape of South America and come up to get to California or travel across the country to get to California. They didn't have railroads. 
you know, so it was it was really tough. But if you could get to Panama on on by boat, boats went to Panama. You could hike over the, the isthmus and take a boat from Panama City up to California. So that's what was going on. There were people were going across. In fact, um, Ulysses S.S. Grant um, took a a, a regiment uh, across Panama by by foot. Because they were being sent to California, and he was a um, a captain, I think, at the time. So a lot of these ent- entrepreneurs in, in in New York that that owned these shipping companies said, "Well, hey, let's build a railroad across, so people could land in uh, in Limon, on the Atlantic side, the Caribbean side, get on the on with all their baggage and everything, get on the railroad, go over to Panama City, get on the boat, and go up to." California. So that was what Stevens did at the end. He got involved as uh, he finally became the president of the uh, Panama Railroad Company, and uh, he brought in Catherwood because Catherwood had been doing the railroad down in South America. So they reunited at the end of their lives. Um, but Stevens died doing the railroad. It was so mu- it was so bad down there cutting their way through the jungle. It was murder. The workers were dying by the thousands to build this railroad. This was long before the Panama Canal. This was 60 years before the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal, by the way, traced the route of the railroad. Um, so um, so Stevens basically um, got one malaria, uh, about too many. He, 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 they got him back to New York City. He died in New York City. And uh, Catherwood, who was in England, happened to arrive uh, about the last week that Stevens was was dying in, in New York City. Um, I found all this out by looking at manifests of ships and all of this and pieced it all together. So Catherwood was with uh, Stevens uh, while he was dying, part of it. And uh, Catherwood lived a little longer, but he died in a major, probably the biggest shipwreck um, in the Atlantic, prior to the sinking of the Titanic. So he had a dramatic end to his life about five years after Stevens. So the book concludes with, um, you know, following them to the end of their lives. So that that was a big part for me. I, I was excited to do all the research into that as well. And, and Cather Woods, you know, going down, that was the uh, Arctic uh, collided with the Vesta. Uh, I remember looking that up. And then you know, just another weird thing about Catherwood is that he wasn't on the ship's manifest originally for some reason, and his friends and family had to do a lot of work just to kind of get him declared as missing on that boat. That episode is a book in and of itself. Um, you know, the captain trying to go down with the ship and still survive. Well, there is there there is a book just on that. There's a book on that shipwreck, um, which was quite helpful to me. Um, but no, he showed up in the newspaper accounts in New York. Uh, kind of as an afterthought, you know, the, the big wigs were all shown, and Catherwood at that point was kind of an obscure figure. Um, but his name showed up in the, in the, in the accounts, the newspaper accounts. So he, he was in the manifest. Um, but it, that's, that, that shipwreck is another, another story, and, and, you know, it takes up a, a, a short chapter at the end of my book. But, you know, all, all of the men went down with the ship, and the women too, but all the crew got off. <laughs> I mean, they got off in the boats, and the, there were no lifeboats. There were very few lifeboats, but they got the lifeboats. They got off, and they went to Newfoundland uh, or, or, or Greenland, I forget, and, and they survived. It was it was a uh, a um, scandal. Um, so uh, a lot of history. <laughs> I, I, I do love history, and uh, doing this book was a joy. Really, I, I just I enjoyed it so much. I hope it comes across in the book. Um, because uh, it was a joy to do, really. I mean, it definitely does. And, you know, just being able to, you know, have two guys, because a lot of times when you read books like this, about this time, about explorers and everything, th- there's usually kind of that seedy underbelly. And like we talked about now, like these are these are two guys who looked out for each other, who put themselves in some really terrible conditions to shed light on something that a lot of people didn't remember or never heard of. 
and really kind of try to do the best they could under the circumstances when you know you just you, you read so many books about things getting done you know by explorers in africa and all these other places where you can read a book and you can enjoy it and sit there and not think like oh i have to hold my nose with what these people were you know really like back then though well you know it's also very important uh, their their work not my book but the, their work was really important because you know prior to this is this is what really captured my really really got me um i wrote the book for a lot of reasons, obviously, you know, it kind of fell into my lap in, in one sense, but in another sense, I, I love Guatemala very, very much. It's a, it's a wonderful country. The Mayas still exist there. They're 40% of the population. And they, you know, they wear their, they do all their own clothing, you know, they're very, you know, they're a fascinating, fascinating cultural, um, you know, I mean, they exist, they still exist there. So, um, uh, I loved that country, and I lived there, and I built a house there, and I, I felt I wanted to give something back to the country. So I wanted to do this book so that it would draw other people to Guatemala um, and uh, and kind of pay back to Guatemala, you know, which could you know that definitely can use the tourist money. I can tell you that. And so I uh, I wanted to do it for that reason. But you know, the, the overriding. Uh, thing about their work was until they wrote those books, the world looked at the Indians of the United States, of North America, of Central America, of South America, essentially as savages. And when I say the world, by the way, I'm talking about Western, you know, Western culture, not only Western Europe, Europe, but also the United States. They, they, thought, you know, the conquistadors came in, they conquered these people. They knew about the Aztecs, which, by the way, were well, well after the Maya. The, the Aztecs didn't even know the Maya existed. That's how far into the future the Aztecs were. You know, they were 400 years after the last of the Maya. And so they didn't even know the Maya were there. They didn't know the ruins were there. Um, so when the Spanish conquered the um, Aztecs, that was probably the Mo and the Incas, those seem to be but somewhat developed uh, cultures. But by and large, the Western uh, people looked down on the savages of America. They, they were very rudimentary. They didn't have a language. You know, they, didn't, they weren't very developed. Well, Stevens and Catherwood changed that completely. And the other thing is that the Western um, view um, was that if there were any ruins or any culture or any, uh, like the Aztecs and Incas, it had to have come from Europe or the Middle East. It had to be the Phoenicians coming over or um, the Atlantis, the great theory about Atlantis, or the Greeks had come over. or some. some it was like they had come over and colonized, and so any ruins that were going to be found in the Americas had to have come from, you know, the the Middle East or Europe. Well, <laughs> it turned out that that's not the case. No one came over to the Western Hemisphere. The only way that the Western Hemisphere was populated was across the Bering Strait, Straits 15,000 years ago. They came across from Siberia, and they came down and they populated. So all the Indians in the Western Hemisphere, up until Columbus, or you know, more or less, were separate, entirely separate from Europe and Africa and, and Asia. And so they developed entirely on their own. And so it says something about the genetic makeup of humans that we, that the human race was able to develop totally separately over 15,000 years, civilizations. And the Maya was a civilization with writing. They created a writing, a form of writing. So, you know, as did the Egyptians with hieroglyphics and, you know, then the, the Greeks and the Romans and so on. But that was all done entirely separately. And that was a revolutionary idea that, that Stevens and Catherwood's um, discoveries uh, made possible for people to understand that these were indigenous Indians that created this, these civilizations of Maya in particular, uh, 
totally up from the roots of their own agriculture and so on in their own development. And so that's really the significance, the overall significance of, of their work. It changed, our, it changed our view of history. Well, listen, Bill, that'll do it for this episode. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, it's terrific talking to you. And that's it for this episode. William, thank you so much. Everyone, Jungle of Stone, amazing book. If you like adventure, exploration, y- you got to have it. And, I mean, there are holidays all around. Speaking of which, be safe out there. Whatever holiday you're celebrating, hope you enjoy them. And that is completely it. There are no more presents coming. But mid-January, Season 3 starts up. We'll see you then, nerds. Till then, stay cool.